Dr. Barbara van Heerden, uh, a warm welcome with, uh, for you at our business school. Thank you so much for your time. So uh, in short, how did you get involved in leadership coaching in Africa? So I was actually working, I worked for many years at Old Mutual um, as a project manager and change manager. And then um, I did a master's in coaching uh, from Middlesex University and the uh, University of Stellenbosch Business School. And then um, I wanted to do for my um, thesis, for my master's, I wanted to do a thesis on leadership coaching for intercultural competence. Um, and my supervisor, when I did my master, said that was a bit of a big topic for a master's. So um, I went on to do my PhD in leadership coaching for intercultural competence um, at the University of Johannesburg. And the reason I wanted to do that was I was working in many different African countries as a leader myself, um, you know, managing a big program for Old Mutual. Um, but I've always had a fascination with culture. So my undergraduate degree, which was UNESA, um, I majored in sociocultural anthropology. So then I, I did my um, research, my thesis, and I coached seven African leaders. Um, and they were, uh, it was a quasi um, leader working in Swaziland, and then three Zimbabweans, two Malawians, and a guy from Kenya. So. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's very very interesting. I, I've read uh, that you mentioned leadership mobilization and stakeholder engagement. Uh, in, in your words, what uh, what's that? So I worked um, I worked as a project or program manager, but I also worked as a change manager. So that's managing the change that we implement as part of the project. Part of managing change, two aspects of it. Um, one of them is leadership mobilization. So, and what that's about, it's around mobilizing the leadership in the organization around the change that you're implementing. Because what tends to happen in big organizations is that leaders, and I'm talking C-suite executives, will do the business plan and the strategy, and then they will decide on a number of strategic projects, and then they will put that into a project office somewhere, and then the project team manages the project. So it wasn't the wrong project to do, and the project team might have delivered on time, on budget, and all that good stuff, but nothing in the organization changes, and the business benefits aren't realized. And part of that is that the leadership almost outsource the project to the project office, and then they step back from it. But the truth is, when it comes to change in the organization, people want to hear about the change and how they're going to be impacted from the leaders. They don't want to hear about it from the project team. So, and that, so the first thing is a lot of leaders don't get that, I have to say. So that's leadership mobilization. And basically, they have to own the vision and they have to support the project team. Um, and the second thing is, um, is employee well-being. I, I am really passionate about employee well-being as a, as a topic. And companies often see employee well-being as a, a fluffy issue, you know, and we might have a well-being program on the side that kind of helps people. But the truth is that employee well-being has a direct impact, and there's lots of research about this, on the bottom line of the company. Because there's a lot of research on something called presenteeism, which is people who are at work but are having problems either with physical or mental health issues. So they're present but they are not productive. And the impact that has on the on the bottom line of your organization is huge. It's just huge. And I think it's also COVID had a big impact on this, I'm sure you know, but, but COVID um, and people starting to work from home and the impact now of the hybrid economy and how that's affecting people and just people's general well-being um, was really affected. And that's, 
employee well-being has a massive impact on the bottom line. I do some health coaching for an organization in Sweden where the guy that owns it is finishing his PhD um, and he, he's an expert in employee well-being and presenteeism and the impact on, on, a, on a company. And I think if any part of the world needs a bit of kindness, nurture and love, it's got to be Africa. You know, the, um, the, the wellness and the well-being, COVID uh, emphasized the shortcomings that was there before. Now it was yes. just in our faces and we are so aware of that. You know, yes. and, and uh, getting back to work, just uh, you, know, you suddenly realize in what sort of a toxic environment we worked uh, even before COVID. Exactly. Yeah. I think, yeah. And I, yeah, what I noticed, the last comment, is that uh, big organizations I was privileged to work at, they had employee well-being programs, but they were tick box exercises. Yeah, that, uh, it wasn't that's of course really, useful. it wasn't really about well-being. It's like a barometer you have to uh, to detect uh, problems up earlier. If there's one thing that you can change for Africa when we speak coaching and uh, leadership coaching, what would that be? So, so the one thing I I'm really passionate about for for leadership in general, but particularly in Africa, is I I believe that leadership's job. One of the key jobs is to create the environment in which everyone can do their best work. That's a, that's leader's job. And their second major job is to be able to inspire followership into an uncertain future. If we can't inspire followership as leaders, then we are like businesses without customers. And so I think that is the key thing. That has got to be the key message for leaders. And by providing the environment where everyone can do their best work and then inspiring followership into an uncertain future, you are dealing with the issues that I've mentioned. You are dealing with cultural sensitivity, DEI. You are dealing with employee well-being. And you are dealing with your ability as a leader to lead change because change is the only constant you know it's so difficult to understand and to do business into africa and of course that is why from from your side a future let's let's look in a crystal ball for a moment the the, the future how is how, your future perspective uh, on this on this topic uh, barbara professor i'm very disheartened that people don't understand culture and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so many people see Africa as a, a place to expand to with lots of opportunities, which I think is true from a business perspective. Um, but what we don't want is economic condolianism. So we're a country, for example, and I saw this, I went to Angola, I was coaching VP in Angola. And I went up there five times. And every time we went, the aeroplane was 80% Chinese people. And China is coming into Africa and they're building airports and roads. And they've rebuilt the harbor in Kenya. But then China owns the harbor. And it's That's a right. form of economic colonialism. And the African people do not benefit. And I am i don't know what we do about rampant economic colonialism. I don't know how to solve that problem. But I meet a lot of good people from different countries who say, no, I'm culturally sensitive. And I say, no, you're not. <laughs> you're, you think you are. But we all have much to learn. I would love to see um, leaders that are culturally sensitive and that start to expand up their businesses into Africa for the benefit of the Africans and for the benefit of the countries that they go to. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of experience all over all over the globe, you know, uh, is, uh, is what uh, made you realize that. Uh, maybe I, uh, we are coming to the end of our of our time, uh, uh, Barbara. Any any uh, uh, closing ideas? Uh, uh, a last remark, maybe for you uh, on this uh, topic. 
I think my last remark would be really just an invitation to any leaders who want to learn effectively, learn to lead effectively in Africa. You know, I would love to see us forming, I don't know, a mastermind group or a community of leaders where we start from a place of let's learn intercultural competence and let's learn how to lead effectively in African countries for the benefit of the people there. Um, that would be my, that, that, that would be a, a vision for me. And uh, my final statement, it's always the soft issues that are the hard issues. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that vision sharing with us. Uh, we have so much appreciation for that, and it's really well uh, possible that that uh, focus group, that uh, study group, research uh, start can start here, here where we are busy with, and I, I'm sure we are going to to uh, uh, meet again and chat again. Thank Let you so much wonderful. for your, thank you so much for your time, and I'll be in touch with you then. Thank you.